Great. Thank you very much, Tanya. And thank you to the San Diego County Office of Education for having us today. And good morning, everyone. Uh, we are going to talk about SDSU and uh, briefly cover some CSU uh, admissions uh, policies and, and procedures and updates to the Cal State Apply application and things like that, and have plenty of time to answer your questions too. But I always like to start within the framework of the CSU, because after all, we are one of the 23 California State Universities. So, whoops. Uh, so SDSU as our southernmost and actually our easternmost California State University, we really are focused on a hands-on approach to our students, being very accessible with our faculty, robust student support programs, a ton of different majors offered, really variables at the different CSU campuses with so many different programs offered. If you're interested in, say, architecture or agriculture, we're teaching education, business, nursing, et cetera, and really priding ourselves on our diversity and all of our financial services as well. Whoops. So you can see on our map here, the state of California, of course, we have 23 different CSUs, all very different, not just geographically, but in size as well. So we just finished up our CSU counselor conferences across the state of California. We hosted a big conference here in San Diego, but we were also in the LA region, in Fresno, in the Bay Area, in Sacramento, in Northern California, uh, really bringing the CSUs to counselors. And we're always paired with uh, uh, Cal State Maritime, which is our smallest California State University. So it's really interesting. We have a CSU within our system with only 1,100 students. And here at San Diego State now, this semester, we're topping out at 36,000 students. So a lot of variables. There's something for everyone and for all of your students up and down the coast uh, through throughout the state of California. Uh, on that note, too, very different locations in the types of settings. So if you have students who are interested in really going to a rural school or going up to Humboldt and uh, in the, to the trees, or of course, in more of a urban setting, we have a lot of different campuses. And nowadays, we have just so many outreach programs for students who are first generation with our education opportunity program now offered at all 23 California state universities, but identity and cultural based centers, fraternities and sororities, and then economic crisis support teams that have really come into fruition over the pandemic so that we really focus on students needs, basic needs with material and what students need for um, really food and just necessities for supplies, but also psychological support too. Uh, as part of our counselor conference, we did a lot of college nights throughout the state, and that was a resounding theme from a lot of the students is what do we offer for support or um, uh, psychological support and those kind of type of mental needs that the students are are really feeling coming back from the, the pandemic. Now, impaction as a word, I want to jump right into impaction and how this really affects admissions, because this was a, also a, a large theme that we had. What is this word impaction that we use? And impaction by our definition is really when a CSU campus receives a greater number of applications from eligible students, but we do not have enough spaces to admit all of those eligible students. So minimum requirements then get elevated and pushed up. The framework of the California Master Plan now 60 years ago, was that California State University admissions would uh, really uh, service the top third of high school graduates throughout the state of California. And we see a lot of our campuses still are able to be accessible to really most of the um, students who are graduating with A through G criteria in the state of California. However, we do have CSU campuses such as San Diego State that have this term impaction applied which means now, of course, it's more competitive to get in. So I want to review the minimum requirements now for CSU entry since the SATs and ACTs are a thing of the past for admission requirements and really jump into what we are now uh, going to be looking at for admission requirements. Um, here is a list of, on the left-hand side, the campuses that are impacted and those that are not. But 
keep in mind that the campuses that are not impacted could have specific majors and programs at the campus level that are still impacted. So a good example of this is the nursing major. I don't know of any CSU at which nursing is not impacted. And so you could have a campus such as say um, Humboldt or Sonoma, where for most of the other majors, we are going, they're going to look at really state minimums for entrance into the university. However, if students are applying into a specific major such as nursing, now they raise the bar for what the criteria is for that particular major. But on the whole, we have campuses on the left-hand side that are uh, deemed as impacted. So if not um, as all of our majors are impacted, then they have more than just a select few that are impacted. So San Diego on this list, Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo, Pomona, Long Beach, uh, Fullerton, Fresno State. These are really our most impacted where we see um, all, if all, then the majority, majority of majors are impacted. So for most of the majors, it's going to be more competitive than just the minimum. Also this year, we have different deadlines for different CSU campuses based on that impaction status. So as of right now, in, in what, October 11th, we are targeting November 30th for the priority filing period for all of the CSU. So that is our still our preferred deadline for even non-impacted campuses. However, these campuses on the right-hand side of your screen here are going to extend their deadline after November 30th. We will have more information once we get to that deadline, but we know for fact it's already approved that Bakersfield, Chico, East Bay, et cetera, are going to still continue to accept CSU applications after November 30th. And those schools on the left-hand side, including San Diego State, are going to close on November 30th. Now, I have said this before, and on the last few days of the filing period, the campus presidents have gotten together and extended the deadline for a few more days until, say, December 5th or so. So you cannot quote me on that. I know this is going to be recorded. So depending on when you view this video, it could be a little bit different. But as of right now, October 11th, we have certain campuses which are definitely closing on November 30th, some that are extending it. However, the priority still and the encouragement and recommendation for be, should be for all of your students to still file by November 30th. For basic CS freshman eligibility, again, we are test free now. So not just test um, blind, I guess we could, we could say it, we are test free. Uh, the caveat to that is we could use SAT and ACT just for course placement purposes. But we're talking about admissions here. So for admissions, we are completely test free. Students do not need to indicate it on the Cal State Apply application. There still is space for it, but they do not need to indicate uh, their SAT or ACT exam scores. And if they do, it will not be looked at and reviewed. So it cannot hurt, cannot help any student if they list it. For eligibility into the CSU system, the A through G courses of course, are still in effect. So the 15 unit comprehensive A through G plan, the entered four years of English, three years of math, two labor uh, laboratory sciences, et cetera. And the GPA, that is a bare bones minimum for all freshman eligibility is a 2.5 or greater. This last bullet point, however, states that between a 2.0 and a 2.49, campuses may use supplemental factors for admission purposes. So of course, as a, as a CSU in the California State University system, we really do everything by, so we have to report data on which students are admitted based on CSU eligibility, who is eligible, who is not based on say A through G completion. Students who have, and I'm talking again, in the CSU on a whole, uh, students who apply to the CSU and have between a 2.0 or 2.49 are not automatically granted admission based on just their A through G completion and having a high school diploma. Rather, we have to look at then some extra qualifying material we'll, we'll get into here. And keeping in mind, again, we're talking about a difference between the, the campuses here. We're really talking about bare bones minimum eligibility right now for non-impacted campuses. Our impacted campuses, such as SDSU, that I'll speak about in a few minutes, 
are higher than these minimums, but these are the bare bones minimums that we're looking at as a system itself to be eligible to the system and to be eligible to impacted campuses with non-impacted programs. So the primary factors that we're looking at for admissions, and we call this new way of doing admissions, our multi-factor admission score. You may remember the eligibility index, which was this calculation between the GPA quantified by 800, and then we're adding in the SATs or the ACT exam scores. Uh, that's gone away. We are looking at in, in 2025 of rolling out a new eligibility index that will actually incorporate some of these features and be a really statewide type of um, equation or, or some type of um, mathematical something that you could see like an eligibility index was in the past. As of right now, though, we have these primary and secondary factors that all of the CSUs have the ability to look at, and whether or not that campus looks at those different areas is really up to the campus impaction. So as I mentioned, the two, let's say for students who are applying to Dominguez Hills as a good example, where none of their majors are impacted, a student with a 2.5 or greater, and this is our A through G, Cal State apply, calculation, so it's taken their 10th and 11th grade GPA, a 2.5 or greater in all their A through G courses, ensuring that they're completing the A through G by the time they graduate in the spring, and indeed that they'll have a high school diploma, those students with the 2.5 to Dominguez Hills are going to be accepted, just based on criteria. For students who apply to Dominguez Hills with a 2.0 uh, to a 2.49, there have to be some other things that are looked at to consider that student for admission. It could be uh, a GPA and courses taken in subjects relevant to a selected major. So perhaps a student is a biology major at Dominguez Hills and Dominguez Hills could say, okay, well students, we can admit that student with the 2.2 have a fourth year of mathematics. They've done algebra one, geometry and algebra two but they've also taken math analysis or statistics. That in and of itself as a four year of mathematics could be used as the supplemental factor to then admit that student beneath a 2.5. Additionally, just the sheer number of academic courses beyond the minimum A through G requirement or other factors such as the location of a high school. We have our local uh, admissions area. All of the CSUs have their local admissions area that could come into play. Uh, free and reduced lunch, et cetera, or student attributes such as generation, low income, foster, or the military service, and indeed act extracurricular activities, work volunteer experience, and leadership roles. So we will take questions um, uh, right at the end here. I know that's kind of a lot to digest, and I haven't jumped into San Diego State and our impaction and our admission requirements yet. So I'm getting there. But first, I just wanted to provide this framework for you. And Cal State Apply is our one application that's open now for all 23 CSU campuses. There are just a few things that are new in 2023 that I wanted to highlight here. First is this wonderful uh, data check here for birth validation. So um, weirdly, we had a lot of students who would put in the date of birth and put in uh, today's date, uh, so it would think that they were zero years old, so now we have a pop-up that has students confirm their actual age when they put in their date of birth. Also, additional questions on the household information and size, and a new question here, which uh, will ask students if they have uh, separated from their parents or step-parents, have had no contact or financial support with them within the last year. Also, just different searches and, and capabilities for high schools attended. So students can search for the SEEB code, uh, of course, by city and zip code, but also we give an, an extra, um, um, how should I say, an, an extra question here uh, or extra capability for students who've gone to high schools at which there are different term types that are offered in different years. So we occasionally run into this where the sophomore year may have been just by semester, then the junior year has switched to trimester. And that was just a, a um, 
challenge for students to fill out. So now we have that opportunity and, and option for students to list both terms dependent on the actual academic year for students in that situation, but there aren't many. Uh, in dual enrollment college coursework, we have a lot of students nowadays who are also attending community college or at least taking summer classes and want to, of course, make sure that's part of their admissions application. We want students, of course, to indicate that appropriately, to indicate what college they've attended to, what the actual is, but to only list it for the one semester in which they took it and earned credit. Some students think they have to list since they know that we're going to grant one full year of high school credit for the college course. And we're really talking about so an A through G category. So if your student has taken, uh, let's say their fourth year of mathematics, they've taken pre-calculus at the community college or at a CSU, we'll grant a full year of high school credit for that class, but they only need to indicate it in that one semester in which they took it. We know on the back end that it's worth a full year of credit and we will give it to them appropriately as such. Very, very, very important. In my opinion, the most important screen here is this A through G matching uh, tile on Cal State Apply. So this is really the key for the California State Universities to see as a snapshot if students have completed their A through G categories in A through G classes. So all of the subject areas and the amount of, of units that are um, earned here are going to have to meet the minimums, of course, but it's on the student to go back and identify for each of these different areas which courses they've had in their high school career will fulfill the categories here. So we want to see a total years of 15 total years, right? So there's 30 semesters worth of all of the different A through G. And we itemize out here the biological science from the physical science, and then you'll see all the rest of the categories, including the electives. Students really need to make sure they take enough time with the Cal State Apply application, and then go through and specifically in all of their semesters, match which courses are A through G um, equivalent here. For many of our students, the majority of students, this is going to be done automatically as they're entering in their courses and certifying that they're actually A through G classes. And of course, we have all of the uh, articulation from your high schools to make sure that it's an auto population there when students are entering it in, they're not having to manually do it. However, there are students who um, may have switched different high schools, may be reporting it incorrectly or having a hard time not finding their classes for whatever reason. And so this is really double check, but to make sure that students have this slide completed and attributing all of their A through G. And I will mention that for any of our Cal State universities, there is a help desk and a help chat on Cal State Apply for students to go to just for questions with filling out the application. But then all of our individual ca uh, campuses, we are all open if there was one kind of common theme last few weeks at our different counselor conferences on the road with my colleagues is that we are all very accessible. We are all very interested in with your students and speaking with you counselors to make sure that your, your students are able to apply online. There is um, in the state of California, some, some things that we talk about as enrollment professionals is just enrollment numbers and targets and making sure that we're having enough students apply. And we are on the recruitment side of, of the admissions uh, team here. So we are actively wanting students to come, not hesitate, uh, not be shy, just come to us if we're not coming to you and pick up the phone, or we have virtual front desks now, students can zoom in with us ask questions and we're more than than happy to help students with the application and answering these type of questions. And we have lastly our fee waiver messages here cleaned up a little bit so still on the last page, um, it would tell students if they're eligible for fee waivers. it's a $70 application fee for each campus that they're sending this Cal State apply application to however students are able to have up to four campuses for a fee waiver if they qualify. And they would qualify based on what they're listing for household size and family income on their um, on the prior screens for their demographic information that they're inputting. 
So these the rates are based very low, I know. Uh, however, students who are eligible will be able to check their fee waiver status by clicking that box there, and it will tell them whether or not they are eligible for these fee waivers. Okay, so let's jump into SDSU um, specific admissions requirements and just stuff. So we are very proud here to um, you know, have a new census with our fall 2022. So it's published yet, so I couldn't put it on this slide. This is last year's student enrollment numbers of 34,842 students. We're now at over 36,000 students for really the first time in a long time. Um, it's not a record. We had a record enrollment over that, I think one time in the 90s and then in the 80s. Uh, but we have 36,000 students plus now on campus. Still about 5,000 of those students are pursuing graduate work. So credentials for teachers, uh, master's degrees, doctoral programs even, and about 31,000 students pursuing our undergraduate um, enrollment. We have so many different things to really talk about, just too many to talk about in a short amount of time. But if you haven't visited campus uh, recently, I definitely encourage you all to come back. I have some links for you too about our campus tours and those type of things, um, which we offer every Monday through Friday. So we're always doing visitation programs and showing everyone exactly what SDSU is all about once you're here on our campus. But we really, really promote our honors program, the Weber Honors College, undergraduate research, access to internships and careers after students graduate. Um, SDSU. So we have a special handshake type of, of uh, program with our career services office, really match alumni and peer with our students to really help make uh, bridging that uh, bridge, so to speak, after students graduate. And then so they're able to get a career and uh, their professional life going. And then promoting student success in a whole different a bunch of different ways with best practices, whether it's study abroad or again, internships or getting students available to do undergraduate research very early in their academic careers. So we are a research oriented or in institution where we are prided on, uh, very proud to have hands-on research as one of our um, our main goals, but also our, our main um, uh best practices that we encourage all of our even first year students to get enrolled in and professors that are actively looking for new students to join them in the labs and to start research early and often. Every March we offer in the spring a student research symposium which encourages all of our students who are doing any semblance of research to present that research and to work with their professors to um, participate in this three-day conference over a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to present their research with their peers and be uh, graded and valued and um, have some positive reinforcement uh, given to them from uh, a variety of prof uh, professors and faculty and staff. So really good uh, practices on campus. And then, as I mentioned, the CSU on the whole has some great resources, specifically at San Diego State. Our identity centers are very active on campus, undocumented resource center, women's center, pride center, et, et cetera, but also our cares and economic crisis response teams, counseling and psychological services, and then, since it's all, also about the academics, having writing support, having math support for these two key features that we have that are foundational in their education and an overall college student success center too, to help students with tutors, free tutors, and to help them academically as well. So more of a holistic approach to all of our support. Of course, I'd be remiss without mentioning our new Snapdragon Stadium and the Mission Valley site that we are getting online. The stadium's open now, of course, with our football team and soccer and lacrosse teams playing there. But we also are, in the coming years, developing the Mission Valley area for a lot of multi-use space. So it will be housing. We'll um, be able to house students there, um, and specifically graduate-level students, but undergraduates as well, and then have facilities for classroom space as well as some commercial space as well, um, and innovative and technological space for uh, new centers that will come 
uh, online. We do anticipate having some hotel rooms and conference spaces there as well. And then, of course, keeping some public space, the river walk, and having 80 plus acres of parks and recreation um, areas and perhaps some other smaller fields for teams to play on. So very excited about Mission Valley. We are an academic college school. So unlike the UCs with a residential approach, we are an academic college approach. We have seven different academic colleges. Uh, it's not based on where students are living. Um, students go to classes all around campus. And literally we have, even in, in my building here, we have an accounting uh, class right next to a philosophy class. So it doesn't sometimes matter what major you're choosing, uh, you could have a location for your class on our campus. Um, the Fowler College of Business for accounting and finance and all of our business degrees are wonderful engineering, focusing on aerospace, civil engineering, bioengineering, construction engineering and management, electrical, uh, environmental, computer, mechanical, College of Education for child development, and then liberal studies for elementary school teachers and our new integrated uh, teaching uh, credential programs. These bachelor and teaching credentials blended into one so that students as even a first year or even a transfer student can apply into our ITEP program, we call them, and are now teaching credential blended in with their undergraduate work so that they don't have to graduate and then go through the stress of reapplying for a credential and getting readmitted and all of that can be blended into their undergraduate. Our College of Human Services, Public health is very um, at the, the tip of everyone's minds, uh, of course, these last few years with the pandemic, nursing, kinesiology, et cetera, and then professional studies in fine arts, communication, criminal justice, film, art, journalism, et cetera. And then rounding out our last majors, we have uh, our largest college by the number of offerings, our College of Arts and Letters with all of the humanities and language and social behavioral science majors, and then our College of Sciences. Um, biology, very um, you know, popular, of course, chemistry, computer science, environmental science, astronomy, et cetera. That all being said, we still allow our first year students to be undeclared and to come in without a major. It is not easier to get in that way. We'll talk about that in just one second, but students can still be undeclared. Pre-professional programs in the bottom right of your screen as well. We have a lot of questions from students who want to go to medical school, who want to go to law school, and they think that that's a particular major that you have to declare right now. There is no major called pre-med or pre-law. Rather, students are getting a degree in any of the offerings that we have, and then moving forward and meeting with our advising professionals so that they can take the right classes, the right prerequisites that medical school or veterinary or dentist, dentist schools or law schools are going to look for, make sure that they take them no matter what major they're pursuing, um, and then to have that guidance in order to then apply into those professional schools um, as they're approaching the end of their tenure here as San Diego State students. So we have a lot of students who just naturally assume you have to be a science major or specifically biology to pursue medicine. That's not the case. Any of the majors um, are, are great preparation for um, professional work. So jumping into admissions here and first covering our important dates, as I mentioned earlier, November 30th as the deadline to apply, uh, specifically for SDSU. Uh, we are very strict with that deadline. November 5th, coming up here in just a month, we have a virtual preview day. It's not in person, it's all virtual, and it is going to provide students a great snapshot of all of the academic colleges I just spoke about. So we will have our deans and assistant deans presenting for one hour that morning on, on the various programs that are in opportunities offered in the colleges. So students should save that date and go to our website, uh, which has a save the date feature on it right now. And more information will be coming up and popping up in the next few weeks for students. And then after students apply by November 30th, we are reviewing applications. And March is when we make decisions typically. So March 1 is really our target, our internal target date to have students notified of admissions. If you have any transfer students, any students you know going to the community college, or if you're a transfer counselor yourself, 
then January is an update that they will make to the Cal State Apply application. We do not require first year students to submit any type of update or halfway grades or halfway marks into Cal State Apply. They're indicating all of their classes that they're enrolled in right now and then planning for their spring semester uh, for their senior year all self-reported. We do not have them go in halfway at the mid-year mark and update their records. In April, after we admit all of our students, April 15th will be an in-person Explore SDSU Open House Admitted Student Day to invite all of our students down to take a look at our campus in person. They can do so before that by our campus tours, but this is the one day out of the year. All of our departments are here uh, really presenting ourselves to students as a huge open house. And then May 1st is our deadline to accept the offer of admission. July 15th is a final official transcript deadline. We require uh, seventh semester grade, so first semester of senior year, by May 1st, that's official transcripts with the student commitment to SDSU. And then July 15th is another round of transcripts with the graduation date posted there and with final spring grades posted as well. A word of warning, we have a no D or F policy in the senior year. So we wanna make that very clear to students that they need to be as successful their senior year as they have already been in their ninth, 10th and 11th grade. For SDSU and the CSU system, we're really focusing in on 10th and 11th grade GPA, but it's the entire academic history that uh, holistically we wanna look at. And if students have Ds and Fs in the senior year, that's a really big uh, warning sign for us. So we have a no D or F policy. Uh, lastly, on this slide, as I mentioned before, SATs, ACTs are not going to be required. Uh, we are test free and test blind. We could uh, want to see them for course placement. So after the fact of admission, post admission, when we look at what level of math and English to enroll students in, SATs and ACTs can provide college readiness scores to us. Okay, and here are some big scary numbers for you about SDSU for this fall of 22. Our average first year GPA was a 3.97. Our average transferring incoming GPA was a 3.4. And total between those two groups of applicants, we had over 99,000 applications. Inclusive of our graduate college, our graduate school, we broke the 100,000 mark, uh, but 99,000 for undergraduate and roughly 77,000 of those students were first year students. So the majority, we have roughly three times as many first year students applying as transfer students. And the average GPA, you can see there's a little bit of a difference. Now, that is not a minimum GPA. That is our average admitted first year GPA. So that's an average. We have students who are above that average and below that average. A few things to discuss here with the, the amount of applications. We don't know where this is going to land this year, fall of 23. Uh, we're expecting to have roughly the same amount of, of applicants. And keep in mind, when we talk about these really large numbers, we're also admitting a large number of students as well. Our admit rate on average for our first year class is about a third. So we are still admitting tens of thousands of applicants, knowing that our yield is perhaps about a quarter of those students. So all of the students that we're admitting, we know about 25% of those students are actually going to accept the offer of admission. Things are a little bit more granular than that when we break it down based on geographic region that students are coming from, even majors, um, GPA ranges. There's all these different yield calculations and algorithms that we look at. But on the whole, we're looking at about a third of our students who apply for first year admission are accepted. The, the big uh, outlier here I want to is our nursing major. For nursing, it's about a 7% acceptance rate. So it is our by far our most competitive major. All of the other majors as, as being an impacted campus where all of majors are impacted, even that undeclared status is considered an impacted category. All of them roughly are about the same there with that third, except nursing as a 7% acceptance rate. We are a direct entry nursing program now. So in, in 
years past, we've been direct entry now, uh, right before the pandemic, and years past, we were able to admit more nursing students, but they were pre-majors and then needed to take prerequisites their first and second year and then apply for the School of Nursing, full nursing degree upon their entering their third year. And we could not accept all of those students. Many students were just having to tread water. And so we um, then would advise them to perhaps choose a different major or a different pathway or apply again the next semester uh, for additional consideration. And so what we've done is made that a direct entry now so that we can guarantee the students who are coming in from day one, guarantee their clinicals that they're going to be graduating with their degree on a personalized four-year degree plan, if that's what their plan is, with a, a dedicated cohort of other students that they're with for all four years. Um, not just for nursing, but for all of our other majors here, you can see in the middle, we have our My Map, which is a four-year degree plan for all of our students. And we have certain majors which uh, we have guaranteed, our California Promise, guaranteed four-year um, uh, graduation numbers for in anthropology, communication, general business, journalism, psychology, and hospitality and tourism management. Many of our other majors, there are also four-year plans, but these as part of the California promise are what we have as far as a written plan that's guaranteed. Note that some of our STEM majors, um, particularly in the um, biological sciences, in our College of Engineering, they be five-year programming on if the students really are loading up in their courses and or taking summer classes, or I should say, um, if they are or are not taking summer classes, that is going to impact graduating in four years. It's entirely possible. However, it's up to that, that student based on their scheduling. We also have seen the last number of years, the amount of students who come in with community college work or other four-year university work already in their belt is just a very high population. And also the amount of students who have AP exam credit is very high as well. And that does a great thing for um, the freedom of their schedules the first and second year, just having a lot of flexibility with what other courses that are targeted, say, as a second year student, what can they then move into their first year and complete as a first year student? And that really helps on their uh, way to a four year um, graduation. On the on the right hand side, uh, we've listed our A through G once again for you, and then also our criteria. So this is a real good snapshot as far as what we are looking at in admissions for SDSU now. Um, GPA, yes, so 10th um, and 11th grade are focused on initially, but in the um, um, after all the said and done with their high school diploma, 10th through 12th grade GPA is, is what we have on the record for the student, weighed up to eight semester honors or AP points preparation towards the indicated area of study. So good framework for this, I think, is for our STEM majors. Let's say you have a computer science interested student or biology or college of engineering. We want to see that students are not just completing the bare bones minimum A through G. They have more classes. They're challenging themselves with the rigor of their courses, but they're not stopping at algebra two. All of our STEM majors require calculus at the college level. So we want to really see students who have challenged themselves and are approaching calculus right now. Um, if not calculus, then pre-calculus. And if not pre-calculus, then more advanced mathematics. So it's important to us that we're targeting students who have that preparation in mathematics, uh, who are going to pursue a major here for which mathematics is needed. If you are a first year SDSU student, you have to enroll in calculus and you are you had only gone through algebra two in high school, there are a lot of stepping stone classes you must complete here and a higher rate of students who are not able to successfully complete those and the time to graduation is then extended. So we've looked at that as more of a, you know, a, a pathway to the degree to make sure that when students enter in, they're really set up for success. And so for our STEM in particular, our STEM majors, we want to see students are challenging themselves with advanced mathematics. For all of our majors, we want to see students are doing above and beyond 
just the minimums for A through G. If it's an option for your students to take more classes than not, then I would recommend them to do so in the A through G categories. And whether those are A through G courses or extra classes at the colleges, at the community colleges for dual enrollment, that's great as well. Or whether they, they're at your home and they're on the A through G list, that's great too. But we wanna see that students are challenging themselves with a more academic heavy schedule. And so the students with our A through G courses completed, certainly above and beyond that minimum, are given a bit of a preference too. Uh, we also will look at um, students in our lo local admissions area. So that's always still a question. Yes, we have our local admissions area, which comprises of San Diego Unified, Sweetwater Union, Grossmont Union, and then extending all the way through Imperial County, all the way to the border of Arizona, actually. Um, the dividing in the northern part of the county is actually the Route 56 freeway, the San Diego Unified Boundary, so to speak. So the um, communities uh, away, Rancho Penasquitos, those are in North County, not part of our local admissions area. That doesn't mean that students are not admitted. We have a, a lot of students from North County who come to San Diego State, but as far as any type of extra consideration for localness, it is only for students who are graduating from a high school within our local area. So that local area extends down from the border. Uh, it's really the boundaries of the ocean, the border, Arizona, and then that state Route 56 um, going eastwards. It's not based on where a family lives. It's based on the high school that the student is graduating from. So um, that is something that, you know, in this, I mentioned the public um, schools here, including, you know, Coronado, but it's also all of our charter and private schools within our, our local boundaries as well. Um, we also will look at students who have first generation status, low income, some other smaller factors. Um, something that has come up recently uh, that we've looked at is students who participate in college preparatory programs, so AVID, Upward Bound, et cetera. Um, those should be listed appropriately on the application as well. We still do not, do not take into consideration extracurricular activities. Um, if students are working, how many hours they're, they're actually working, those type of things we think are maybe still affected by uh, the pandemic. So we're not um, looking at those um, for admission purposes. It really is academically focused um, in that way. I mentioned also um, review based on self-reported information. We do not require transcripts up front. We require them only after students are admitted. And then by May 1st, if students are accepting the offer of admission, and uh, at that point, their seventh semester transcript submitted to us. And then the last round in uh, July, by July 15th with spring grades. And no D or F grades, as I mentioned earlier. And then very briefly, I just wanted to touch on transfer admission. If you are a transfer counselor or working with transfer students or your seniors in school who are thinking about this route, it's a great route to take. And there has been a drop in, in community college enrollment the last couple of years with the pandemic. So I think this pathway is actually going to be much more accessible moving forward. We're, we're already able to accommodate a lot of our students who are um, from our local admissions area for our community colleges. About 80% of our incoming transfer students are from our local community colleges. So this is a great benefit for students who are thinking about this pathway. It can certainly be a cheaper option. Um, and we have uh, two-year degree plans, a two-year plan for what students would need to complete at the community colleges, get admitted to SDSU, and then complete two more years and graduate still within a four-year time frame. And those students we speak with all the time immediately upon their entrance into the community colleges. So we count students throughout that two-year journey at the community college, make sure they're up, um, they're on track and, and up to speed with their courses. And you can see in the bottom uh, box here, we have our admission pathways, a general pathway, but we also have a still a transfer admission guarantee for students taking 100% of their community college courses from community of our local communities, and then also an associate degree for transfer and ADT as a um, priority plan. So the requirement is, is really two years, a 60 transferable unit count, 
inclusive of general education and then courses specific to a, a specific degree plan, a specific major, and then looking at their GPA, not from high school, but looking at any uh, all of their community college coursework. And again, that average is a 3.4 versus the 3.97 that we had for first year um, students. Our cost is here. So we're a little bit over $8,000 for basic tuition and fees for the entire academic year. So that's two semesters. So 8174 is our current rate for both the fall and the spring semester inclusive. Um, students do pay, do pick different classes in the fall than they do in the spring. So it's roughly $4,000 that's owed in, in by the time of registration in August, and then another 4,000 in December and January prior to um, starting their spring semester. The largest fee you'll see on here is for typical on-campus food and housing. These numbers are what are reported to the federal government for FAFSA concerns, very high end um, in my opinion. Um, we have many students, many, many students who are not spending um, nearly that much, but the price and cost of living has really skyrocketed over the last few years. We're aware of that. So trying to keep um, uh, student support with finances, um, very active with financial aid, and then a lot of academic scholarships that we're able to give out in the spring and summer uh, sessions to our students who are then enrolling for that next fall. So our scholarships go live in of each year. Students, once they accept the offer of admission, can then go and apply for so many different scholarships just with one singular scholarship application to match them up. And it would make them, um, once they do that one general application, the system matches them up to other scholarship opportunities that will have them write essays for all these other scholarships that they might be eligible for. And we have so many students on campus who have either scholarship support or financial aid, uh, federal state grant um, support as well. So we really encourage our uh, students to apply for um, FAFSA um, in the fall semester after they complete their Cal State Apply application. Housing is required for students for two years if they are considered a non-local first year student. So that dividing line, once again, that 56 freeway, is our dividing line there. Students graduating from schools south of that line and extending east are not required to live on campus. They can if they would like to, and if they're part of our Weber Honors College, um, it is a requirement, but otherwise they do not need to as a requirement. Students in North County and all locations, it is a requirement to live on campus for two years. For students who are from North County, particularly students who are perhaps being south of that 56, but then be going to Cathedral or, or one of our high schools right across that boundary, there is a petition process so that you're aware where students can petition the requirement and um, say that you would like to be a, a commuting student for that first and second year um, and provide paperwork as far as where your residence is. So that is a process we definitely do have. I want to uh, voice to you for our students who are required to live um, on campus, but still within vicinity of say driving distance. The benefits for living on campus is of course, um, uh, well, we see academically higher GPAs and higher success rates, but also just your social network and, and the balance and having access to our resources 24 seven. We have in particular residential communities. So part of that paperwork for doing your housing um, uh, contracts is identifying if you wanna be part of our residential living learning communities and you're interested in such topics as um, say a pre-law community or the pride house or um, nursing or journalism, uh, we will make our best effort to then enroll you into that residential living learning community so that in our residential halls, you're living with those students who have a similar interest, and you're also taking a class together as well. So we can blend your academic and your, your living world. And we've seen a lot of students who've made such great connections that way and friends for life um, going through our, our process like this. So beautiful campus, come join us. Uh, we have all of our resources for you, our website down here, sdsu.edu slash counselors. We have a direct counselor phone number for you. Please don't give this to your students. 
But if you need to call us and get in like right away and have a question answered, calling 619-594-6966, that will jump you to the beginning of our, our phone queue and you can talk to one of our counselors right away. And then this is my contact information. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have questions as well. My phone number is 619-594-897 or mhebert at stu.edu. Our counselor website there in our campus tours you can find on our website offered Monday through Friday. And again, on November 5th, a Saturday, November 5th, beginning at 10 o'clock, we have our virtual preview day. And I um, encourage you to join us and to have your students join us as well. And on that, I will open it back up to Tanya and we can take some questions if, if anyone has any questions. Well, great job, Matt. And I love that counselors have direct access right to SDSU. That's fantastic. Does anybody have any questions on the CSU system updates or on SDSU? I can't believe 99,000 applications. That's just crazy. That's But that's good news. All right, so being that I'm not seeing any questions, you have Matt's information there. So like you said, feel free to reach out for him, reach out to him. And just know that this is being recorded and will be posted by the end of the week on our SDCOE School Counselor webpage, as well as the slide deck. So thank you, Matt. Thank you for taking time to uh, provide this information. It's always great to see SDSU just really growing and increasing in all of their programs and really fitting in with the times um, where we need to be and just supporting San Diego students. So thank, well, thank you, you so much, Tanya. Yeah. All right, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.